The Little Book of Accessibility. Hi, I'm Gareth Ward Williams. 16 years ago, I founded the BBC's digital accessibility team. I have finally moved on from that role, and looking back over my time, I posed a question. If I had had a TARDIS and could travel back in time to 2005, and had 20 or so minutes to give myself advice, what would I say? What is the best advice I could give me? From that, I have pulled together this presentation. This is a book, a little book of quips, tips, affirmations and truths that have helped me shape the BBC strategy and embed accessibility into its culture, and I wish I had known when I started out. I think it would be fair to say that when I started out, the resources at hand were at best three years behind the industry requirements and there was no precedent for AV, games or large-scale delivery of accessibility. Uh, and the advancement of user and production technology was quickening. So here's the little book that could have helped me through uh, processes at that time. Everybody, anywhere, community, diversity, universality, usability and inclusion are all accessibility words. Finding the language of accessibility within any organisation is tricky. Accessibility is a loaded word which can work both to its benefit and detriment. It can help contextualise problems for particular user groups, but it can also foster the sense and the culture of otherness. The BBC's organisational ethics were clear, but I still needed to explore the language to make sure accessibility wasn't treated as additional to the mainstream, but discussed as part of the mainstream. 20% of the United Kingdom's population has a disability, so the audience is a significant size. And words like everyone, diversity and inclusion were littered throughout the organisation's policies, strategy, statements and executive speeches. None of these words are caveated with except them when it came to disability, and as such none of the associated objectives could be realised without accessibility. Games and media are social currency, so don't actively leave anyone out of the conversation. People like to talk about their shared experiences, and if a group of children or adults have all played the latest game or watched a programme, but that excluded someone because of their impairment, they would not only be left out of the fun, but would also be left out of the conversation afterwards. So if you are developing a content proposition, ensure that the approach is an inclusive experience that avoids socially excluding anyone. Invest enough time to shift the conversation from worthy to worthwhile. This is one of the hardest and most necessary cultural challenges for any organisation. An epiphany comes when an organisation realises that instead of building things and trying to make things accessible, the most efficient and effective thing to do is to build accessible things. Accessible things take no more time and effort to build than inaccessible things. In fact, they take less time as you don't have to fix them afterwards. Then there are benefits. There is a lot of research that proves accessible products and services increase audience reach and share create more engagement opportunity, improve usability for everyone and increase customer loyalty. Accessibility positively impacts on the robustness and universality of products and also improves the overall brand perception. All of these are not nice to haves in business. They are worthwhile and are all outcomes of accessibility if it is managed correctly. So why not invest in them? If you cannot guarantee you have everyone's opinion, you can't make decisions that will benefit everyone. If any part of your audience is not able to participate in your research, either because of the approach, platform or methodology, then you're always going to have skewed data. As disabled people make up at least 20% of any audience, that is a huge number of opinions and data lost that would have otherwise been invaluable to, invaluable to your organisation especially if it cares about informed decision-making. Marketing demographics are not useful for design research. Insight comes from focusing on human characteristics, contexts and barriers. I am a 50-something-year-old white male from the north of England with specific interests and hobbies. None of that has any bearing on 
how design choices impact on my experience of a product, yet this data is often gathered on projects where there is little information on user characteristics or barriers experienced. Even when it comes to capturing data on medical conditions, this is still fairly useless as it tells researchers very little about the lived experiences, skills, coping strategies and capabilities of a user group. As a result, data that could have been full of rich intersectional insight ends up being disappointing when it comes to recommendations and outcomes. So look for better ways of drawing out information about users that has relevance to behaviours, skills and traits. Data is not the plural of anecdote. Stories and personal uh, testimony are incredibly useful, but mostly for understanding potential barriers, coping strategies or forming hypotheses. One thing an anecdote will never give you is an answer. Although there is always the caveat that hundreds of independently sourced and verified anecdotes or interviews do provide evidence, but qualitative studies almost never run at a scale to be considered statistically significant. And yet time and time again I hear anecdotes being presented as if they were data and irrefutable fact. They can even get upgraded to conventional wisdom and become very difficult to shake off. Accessibility culture eats WCAG compliance for breakfast. The simple underlying truth about accessibility is that it is all about organisational culture and culture comes from the top. As an accessibility manager, one of the key responsibilities is to not just find the rhetoric, but also identify the willingness to believe in it and nurture that into widespread cultural practice. There are many ways to do this, but one that can be especially effective is the establishment of an accessibility champions network that amplifies your organisation's ethics and mission. Accessibility is emotional as much as it is functional and technical. The three components of accessibility that Bruno Marg talks about are something we can all understand. Everything has an emotional resonance, has to function because after all this is design and needs to technically work. This is something that is all too often missing from conversations as accessibility works in lasting and meaningful ways when you find the balance between all three. Accessibility is already mainstream, as it can be transient, generational, environmental, situational. Some of us have lifelong conditions or impairments, which means that we have certain dependencies on UX or technical approaches. But from a more universal perspective, accessibility reaches beyond the user because impairment can be caused by environmental factors or situations. Here are some examples to get you thinking. Number one, battery life. Colour contrast supports the user behaviour of battery preservation. Commonly, people turn the screen brightness down on their battery powered devices to extend the life of the battery. The highest contrast possible optimises the outcome for the user. It also reduces the amount of times the device needs charging. So it helps with sustainability too. Two, holding things. People carry bags, babies, hold handrails or others' hands, and at the same time they use devices. Can your application be operated using one hand only? 3. Mainstream captioning. We no longer consume all our AV content by sitting down in front of a TV. We are on the go, in social situations and public spaces. This is why social media platforms report around 80% of all AV is watched with captions switched on. Even long-form VOD providers such as BBC iPlayer have between 30 and 40% of their content viewed with the captions on on mobile devices. Hearing impairment in context of the environment is mainstream. Captions are, fundam as, are as fundamental as the pictures or the audio, so give them the same consideration. Number four, nighttime cognitive and motor impairment. At night, we all become cognitively and motor impaired because we are tired, exhausted, distracted if we are having a social evening, and we can be chemically impaired with alcohol, etc. So if your product gets used a lot at night, have you researched its usability in that context? 
The one and only cardinal sin in design is not designing for the reality in which people live. This is probably my favourite quote from the product designer Dieter Rams. There are so many layers to this statement. Understanding user contexts takes into consideration both the wide variation of users and the breadth of situations they find themselves in. This then should feed into the approach you take to your design research. Recruit according to demographics, so if 20% of the population is disabled and 15% is neurodivergent, then that should equally apply to your participant groups. Then run your research in real-life situations and contexts, focusing on human and environmentally specific barriers. Inaccessibility is proactive, so at the beginning of a project it is important to get the team to ask the question, who are we willing to exclude? This is such a useful exercise when it comes to establishing ground rules at the start of a project and ensuring accessibility is not descoped or deferred, which is essentially descoping. The question seemed loaded at first, but when you settle down with it, you'll find it's rather useful and can be helped along with both marketing and design research data. For instance, if you're designing a news application, you might not want to be actively including the under fives. That's not to say you'll be actively excluding them, but the service might obviously not be for them, unless of course you are designing a children's news service. Other groups might be determined by geography, platform, language, situation, all sorts. What will you end up with is a very useful list. Then all you have to do is to make sure that during the process of designing and developing the product, you don't start adding to that list. Ensure your UX design does not disable people. One key thing all UX designers should understand is the social model of disability. This is absolutely fundamental to being able to, to get UX accessibility right. The social model points out that, I quote, people are disabled by barriers in society, not by their impairment or difference. Barriers can be physical, like buildings not having accessible toilets, or they can be caused by people's attitudes to difference, like assuming disabled people can't do certain things. Every decision a designer makes either retains or excludes users. When a product is just a concept, then everyone has equal access, but as soon as we start to shape the product, that is when disability is either kept out or designed and engineered in. Accessibility simply isn't something you add to a project, not unless you are planning to break the UX of your product as part of your product development process. So if you find your, your teams are regularly refactoring designs after accessibility testing, then support them with better training to help them develop inclusive practice. The person writing the alt text should be the person who chose the image in the first place. There are right and wrong ways to approach the production of image alt text, but there is one desired outcome for everyone to understand the purpose of its use. Alt text must convey the editorial intent of the use of an image. I've paraphrased, but if you are designing comparative experiences for both sighted and vision impaired users, then aim for equivalence of the information and outcome. So if the image is an infographic that conveys a key point, summarize that point or if it is brand furniture or in other words is just there for aesthetic purposes then it can remain silent but if it is a logo then just say the name of the brand it represents because that is what it conveys the production of the text then boils down to three groups marketing have the responsibility for all brand assets ux design for icons and other functional imagery Content producers for everything else. Script your videos as if there were no pictures and then add pictures. There are four access services for AV media. Captioning, InVision sign interpretation, audio description and the other one that nobody talks about, by media production. Never heard of it? That's because it is invisible to all users. Rather than by media being an additional program asset, it is a production ethos that makes content accessible without audio description by scripting or presenting as if there are no pictures. AD can then be added to content where there is 
action or image that cannot be described within the narrative. There is the common misconception that all AV content has to have audio description to be accessible. But if it is scripted using bimedia methodology, then most of the content will be perfectly accessible in its default state. Certain content types such as reportage, interviews, panel shows, music programming and live events lend themselves nicely to this approach. BBC TV has been using this since the 1990s, so it can be used for online AV production. So next time you are scripting a video, write a script, write a radio script and then film it. Take the time to understand the reasons behind common knowledge and convention. This way you can separate the facts from the urban myths. This is something I learned the hard way early on in my accessibility career. And I think my epiphany came when I started to investigate font accessibility. There is more information about the readability and legibility of fonts than anything else I have come across. The days I have wasted on projects based on conventional truths that subsequently fell apart is probably my biggest regret. We all want to fix things and, and can all too easily get into solution mode before we have taken the time to ensure that we are asking the right questions and thoroughly check the sources that informed our decision making. Affordances and conventions are the cornerstones of cognitive accessibility. What are affordances and conventions? An affordance is the, a perceived way in which an element will behave when interacted with. A web convention is an established design norm that, uses, that users expect websites to follow. Both conventions and affordances help create a user's cognitive schema so that they know where to expect uh, to find certain kinds of information and what the function of an element is and what they expect to happen when they interact with that element. Not being mindful of this introduces risk and can negatively impact on the experiences of all users. Something that is worth considering is to try and identify users with particular cognitive barriers in your uh, research or user groups. What will be a poorer experience for most people could be a total barrier for them. They are the canaries in the design research mine. Font performance is the foundation of to, foundation to visual accessibility. This is such an obvious statement. This one foundation of UX design does not get the focus it deserves. Not choosing an optimal font and then trying to apply accessibility guidance to it is like what Jared Smith called in 2014 putting accessibility lipstick on a usability pig. So take the time to understand the fundamentals of font accessibility, research the options, test if possible, and make the best choice available to you. HTML is screen reader UX. For screen reader users, their UX is not a visual interaction uh, manifestation of the code, but an audio one that exposes more of the structural design of the code itself. This means that how a page is coded is both a UX and technical concern. There are decisions such as semantic structure, tabbing orders, and the visual and audio behaviours of designed elements that should be designed experiences. It is also useful to think of HTML as having a moral code. This will enable you and your teams to frame any discussion about the ethics of a particular technical framework from the perspective of delivering an inclusive user experience. So whether you're a designer, a developer or a software engineer, at the end of the day it is all UX to someone. Compliant is not an answer to any other question except, is it compliant? Without getting into the reasons why compliance is good, yes it is good because what it takes to be compliant is pretty sensible stuff, but at the same time, you have to recognise that compliance does not answer the question, is my product accessible to disabled users? But it will keep your compliance officer, policy team and lawyers happy. If you have compliance as an objective, make sure you uh, only look at it as compliance rather than thinking it is an answer to all your accessibility problems. WCAG is 
A foundation, not an answer. A benchmark, not an ambition. A resource, not a tool. A work in progress. In WCAG, there are different levels A, AA, AAA. It's clever as everyone go for AA as no one wants to do the really difficult stuff in AAA and A is the equivalent to buying the house wine on the menu. The problem comes when an organisation's accessibility model matures. That is when guidelines should become something not to fall below rather than something to achieve. And the guidelines should evolve as more is achieved, otherwise your accessibility programme could stagnate. WCAG is also not the easiest thing to use. Although that is something we can't really uh, can't really be avoided as it has to balance being as comprehensive as possible whilst remaining organisationally agnostic. Auditing answers three questions only. Where are we now? How far have we come? How consistent are we? Health check audits are really useful as they give an idea of where deeper investigation is needed. They can tell you where you need greater consistency. So for instance, an, audience, uh, an audit of uh, labelling conventions is useful. Pan estate audits or monitoring can also help identify teams who are particularly struggling and need more support. Audits can also illustrate ongoing uh, improvement over time to your executive committee. But the one thing audits do not do well is being part of a product, product development process. Product usually goes through three phases, shape, build, run. But auditing, but adding auditing to that, you get shape, build, audit, reshape, refactor, run, audit, re-refactor, run again, which isn't effect, efficient, effective or sensible, particularly in an agile environment. By focusing on a more embedded approach to accessibility, you can utilise your auditing resource in a way that makes it productive and progressive rather than disruptive. Build accessible websites from accessible components and cut the workload in half. One of the core functions of any accessibility team is to make accessibility possible, scalable and sustainable. The team needs to work with the business to provide resources that contextualise accessibility and make it easy. If you have a UX component library, then you need to ensure that everything in it can be built accessibility, accessibly. Then deliver technical documentation that takes the design library and expresses it in a way that is more meaningful to developers. These documents should contain reference implementations, research resources and test scripts that focus on defining the behaviour of the code rather than determining the code itself. They then need a community or guild to ensure they become living documentation and that they stay relevant. Machines benefit from accessibility too. This is a just a reminder to all product managers about what accessibility does beyond all the obvious user benefits. Robustness. A worldwide, the World Wide Web is a standards-based platform and these standards and related guidelines are developed by working groups at W3C and all browsers are built to support these standards. Valid HTML and accessibility guidelines will not only help you reach and you help your reach and share but they will also help lower the risk of products breaking when browsers or assistive technologies update. Progressive enhancement supports inter internationalization. The cost of data is a socio-economic accessibility concern. Many developing nations do not have data plans or the breadth of end-user equipment that supports more sophisticated technical frameworks. They are just too heavy or JavaScript dependent. If the organisation you are designing or developing for has an audience that is truly international, then think about the cost of access and build using progressive enhancement. Image metadata. Good alt text describes the editorial intent and by doing so gives great contextual metadata for image searches. Time-coded metadata. Captions and even audio descriptions both start out as time-coded scripts. Between them, you have time-coded narrative and descriptive metadata that can be used for archiving content. The BBC built its archive clip search tools off the back of the access services 
enabling editorial staff to do deep searches and find accurate quotes and clips going back to when access services first began. Findability. Google indexing uses link text, semantic structure, alt text and other tags, whilst YouTube prioritises well-captioned videos. If you want to be found, then think about what accessibility does in this respect. So when you are considering the business case for accessibility, consider all the technical benefits as well as the user benefits. And if you take a component led approach, then you'll make it even easier to achieve. Evidencing compliance is the concern of a vendor, whilst evidencing equivalence is the concern of an employer. Many organisations declare themselves as being inclusive employers to both disabled and neurodivergent people. Actually delivering inclusive employment in an effective way means a few considerations. There are obvious ones like ensuring the employment process and corporate communications are accessible, as well as making sure there are workplace adaptations and other such reasonable adjustments. However, there is one area that remains problematic, and that is the digital environment. Legislation in the EU and the UK is behind the US in this respect as it demands compliance only, whereas Section 508 also focuses on usability. Section 508 is ex exactly right. The procured system can be fully compliant and yet the experiences of its use between disabled and non-disabled users can be far from comparative. For example, if a taxi booking system could take a sighted member of staff five minutes to complete a booking, but an assisted technology user 20 minutes, where are they expected to find the additional 15 minutes? Are they expected to work later, have less breaks, or simply be less productive? The compound effect of multiple unusable systems is that your design, you will design and engineer people out of the jobs you have made available to, for them. Your accessibility policy tells the story of how far you've come, whilst your accessibility statement sets out how far you intend to go. Accessibility policies and statements are obvious, often mixed up and become rather confusing to read. And it can become difficult to identify which is a commitment to maintain and which is an, in uh, an intention for improvement. A statement is useful especially if you are in the early stages of your organization's accessibility journey. It should build on and contextualize the existing mission statement and be self-aware of the improvements needed. A policy, however, should not be an ambition, but a reflection of everything that your organization does and can continue to do so in terms of accessibility. It should be high level, but broad enough to benchmark all your core activities and values. Keep ambition out of your policy and say, this is where we are today because this is what matters to us. Policies are also useful as they both tell teams what is expected of them and users what to expect. If the policy is clear, then the product team's output and audience expectations should align. There are no magic accessibility wands, so be suspicious of strangers bearing gifts and big promises. To round the book off, I'm finishing with a warning about anything that presents itself as too easy to be true. If a wall has a big hole in it, putting paper over the hole might not cover it, might cover it, but it does not make the hole go away. So if anyone tries to lean on it or hang a picture, you're back to having a hole again. The same can be said for accessibility plugins. They are a brittle veneer to a problem that never provides a solution beyond something temporary and aesthetic. Are they better than nothing? Maybe the effort and money invested in them spent on doing something more robust is a better approach than trying to sweep accessibility under the plugin carpet. So accessibility is a broad subject. It positively impacts on everyone. It is full of opportunity. It is as much about emotion as it is about function and compliance alone will not give an organization or its users what is needed. But there is so much opportunity if you take the time to ask the right questions.